Hey everybody, it is You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes from the insane pumpkin carver who says, Steve, if you could add or remove five things from the Constitution, what would they be? Please take your time. I like details. Well, that's why I'm glad this is the first question, insane pumpkin carver. Uh, five things I would add or remove from the U.S. Constitution. I would uh, modify the Second Amendment to clarify uh, that governments, state and local and federal governments, uh, have the right to regulate gun ownership uh, for the purposes of public safety and public health. I would insert more explicit language establishing that the federal government and the governments of the states and local governments under their jurisdiction are all to be secular governments and that there is to be a separation of church and state, which is pretty much agreed upon and is 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 the state of things legally uh but i think it would it would help settle a lot of these arguments if that were stated outright unambiguously in the constitution secular government separation of church and state um i would want to put in a uh, an equal rights amendment uh again to sort of clarify things that are already mostly upheld through court decisions uh like uh no discrimination on the basis of, and then the whole long list of, of uh, protected categories. No discrimination on the basis of gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, uh, religion, country of origin, uh, ability or disability, health status, you know, um, age, uh, all of these uh, protected categories that, that we have come to recognize over the past several decades uh, that need to be uh, guaranteed protection against discrimination. I would, uh, I would put that explicitly in the Constitution, a super-powered, bulked-up, fucking kick-ass Equal Rights Amendment. That's three. Fourth, I would specify health care and education as basic civil rights of all people in the country. And uh, fifth, I would establish a, a universal basic income. Those are the five changes, the five additions or changes that I would make to the Constitution if it were up to me. Brandon Davis. Hey, Steve, in regards to the Oregon situation where the Bundy family took over federal buildings on a wildlife refuge, I couldn't help but notice how it demonstrated the failure in the modern concept of militias and gun owners overthrowing the government. Here was a situation where the Bundy family was so sure that others would join their cause only to find themselves to be a lone group of despots. What I gathered from these revolutionary types is that they seem to have a very simplistic good guy versus bad guy mentality and forget about the diversity of their own country. Even if things got so bad to the point where they felt a revolution was in order, there's a good chance that many others would not agree and they would end up operating under their own authority instead of the authority of the people. What are your thoughts? Also, would you be interested in doing a five stupid things about sovereign citizens? It would be nice to see this group poked in the eye. Thank you, Brandon. Five Stupid Things About Sovereign Citizens is now on my list of potential topics. Thank you, Brandon. That is a great suggestion. The, the sovereign citizen movement is a cornucopia of bullshit and bat shittery. So uh, I will definitely look into doing a video about that at some point in the future. Yeah, I. it's, it's that they... The, these would-be revolutionaries, like uh, the, the people who, you know, tried to start an uprising in Oregon, they, they don't take into account the diversity of the country. They don't take into they, they don't realize that they are a minority ideologically. I also think they, they really uh, underestimate the complacency of the American people. Because <laughs> um, think about this, right? The, the biggest, the biggest uh, armed insurrection in American history was the Civil War. Uh, that didn't just happen overnight. That was the result of a hundred years or more of simmering tension over slavery and economic issues and racial issues. Like, and it just it took a hundred years before it finally boiled over and became like a, a, an armed conflict. Um, on a much smaller scale in, in the 1960s when there were riots during the height of the black civil rights movement. Again, that was an explosion that had been building up for a hundred years by that point, a hundred years since the Civil War. Um, so people getting violent and, and, and you know, standing up to the government in, in violent protest and, and even to the point of maybe taking up arms, that's something that Americans just don't do very often and don't do very lightly. 
and usually that's a good thing. Uh, sometimes I kind of wish that, that we were less complacent as a people. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't ever want to see someone taking up arms and trying to lead a, a revolution to overthrow the government. But I do sometimes wish that, you know, when there are thousands of people leading, uh, taking part in marches in major cities to protest uh, police violence against people of color, I do wish that we were less complacent about that, that we were more willing to look at that and say, oh shit, this is bad, we need to fix this. Uh, instead of just changing the channel, as I think many of us do. Um, but yeah, the, the complacency of the American people is not something to be underestimated. Uh, and I think the, 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 the Bundy bunch grossly underestimated that. Uh, they, they grossly underestimated how just sort of satisfied with the way things are most people in America are, for better or for worse. Shades of Cascades. Steve, did you like Enterprise? It's my favorite, but it's certainly the black sheep of the franchise, and it gets a really bad rap in my opinion. Captain Archer is the perfect example of what exploring should look like, and I think Scott Bakula plays the wide-eyed explorer, yet strong and seasoned captain very well. What are your thoughts and feelings about Star Trek Enterprise? I liked Enterprise a lot more than I liked Voyager. Uh, I do not I do not think that Enterprise is the black sheep of the franchise. I personally put Voyager in that position. I hung in there with Enterprise for most of those four years it was on. I kind of dropped off toward the end. I just sort of lost interest after uh, about season three. And uh, I, I didn't think it was a great show. I mean, I, I didn't love it. I didn't feel it ever lived up to the potential of its premise. I think there was potential there to do like a real change in direction, to do like a real more realistic uh, sort of low tech closer to our reality version of Star Trek and make it more about exploring and, and, and position the, the crew of the Enterprise more like astronauts rather than, you know, a crew on a Star Trek ship. But ultimately, it just turned into another Star Trek show. It was just, oh, it's, a, it's just a Star Trek show. And they have a grappling hook instead of a tractor beam, you know, and they have phase pistols instead of phasers, and they have, uh, you know, uh, armor plating instead of shields. But it was... I mean, the, the vocabulary was different, but it was basically a Star Trek show. And even a lot of the aliens were the same, and a lot of the stories were very similar. So it wasn't my favorite show. I didn't think it was great. But I did really like Scott Bakula. I'm a huge Scott Bakula fan. I'm with you on that 100%. I, I did like Captain Archer for the most part. I've loved Scott Bakula since Quantum Leap. I mean, I watched, I'm old enough to have watched Quantum Leap when it was originally on the air, and I loved it then. I still love it now. I watch it sometimes on Netflix, and I'm just a huge mark for Scott Bakula. So I'm with you on Scott Bakula. I think he was awesome. Jason Brunet, right now, pick up the book closest to you, turn to page 51, read until you hit the first proper noun on the page, and do an improvised five stupid things about whatever that happens to be. That is not a question. That is a command. All right, this is the closest book to me at the moment, and this is absolutely legit, and I think it's probably telling. Uh, the book is Come and Knock on Our Door, The Story of Three's Company. Page 51, and the first proper noun on the page is <laughs> Billy Crystal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, here are five stupid things I've noticed about Billy Crystal. He is really terrible when he tries to be hip. Billy Crystal is getting old now, and uh, when you see Billy Crystal on TV or on a commercial or on a promo for something, he will try to make a hip, relevant reference. Like he'll throw out, like a couple years ago, the last time he hosted the Oscars, uh, they did this thing where they, 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 they went on a trek to find Billy Crystal to bring him back to host the Oscars again, and they found him like living in the wilderness with long hair. And, he, and they said, Billy Crystal, we've come to, in, to have you come back and host the Oscars. And he turned at them and he said couldn't you just send me a text and then he like did it like a, a a mr roper fourth wall break turned to the camera and went like you know like ah eh, see huh i made a reference to a contemporary thing i'm hip um number two his humor tends to be schmaltzy uh very very schmaltzy like he he did a a one-man show for a long time uh, on Broadway and, and around the country as well called 700 Sundays that was uh, about him and his father which is very sweet and very sincere and I'm sure it meant a lot to him but you know whenever Billy goes into the emotional side of things uh, with his comedy 
it gets really, really schmaltzy really fast. Like he is the, he's one of the kings of corn. Um, I think he probably gets that from his background. I mean, he's from that era of showbiz where that's kind of how you did it. You said something funny, but if you wanted to cut the, the humor with a little bit of heart, you went totally overboard and you and you just turned it into a, just a, a big fat bowl of fucking treacle. So that's number two. Uh, number three, I don't think any of his movies have been terribly good. Uh, City Slickers was all right, I guess. I mean, it wasn't terrible. It, it had its moments. It was funny. Jack Palance was good. Uh, but for the most part, Billy Crystal's film career has not been great, and at times it has been downright dire. I mean, he did a movie in the 90s with Robin Williams, who is another guy who is just uh, fantastically talented, who made more than his share of, of bad movies, uh, and also occasionally sort of veered into schmaltz in his performances, not so much in his comedy, but in his performances. Um, but uh, he made a, a movie with, with Robin Williams called Father's Day that was just fucking awful, just awful. Uh, so, Billy Crystal's film career, not great. Uh, what else? Number four. Um, his years on Saturday Night Live were not the best. He, he, or I'll put it this way. He was a member, he was a cast member of Saturday Night Live during one of its worst periods. I'll put it that way. During like sort of the, the, the mid-80s Dick Eversoll era, where there were some incredibly talented people on the show. Right? I mean, in addition to Billy Crystal, you also had, like, Christopher Guest, you know, and uh, Harry Shearer. I mean, just really incredibly fantastic. Julia Louis-Dreyfus, I think, was on during that time. Uh, just really fantastically talented people, but the show itself was just awful. It was just awful. Not funny at all. So Billy Crystal, uh, unfortunately, was stuck on Saturday Night Live uh, during that that time frame, that sort of dead zone when it was at, almost at its lowest period. And number five... Uh, worst thing about Billy, the stupidest thing about Billy Crystal, he's a Yankees fan. I have no respect for a Yankees fan. I get it. You grew up in New York. How many times did he tell that story? He told it in baseball. He told it in fucking city slickers. Uh, about, oh, the first time my dad took me to Yankee Stadium and, and we stepped in and we saw that big copper roof. And I looked out and I saw the monuments in the outfield. There were statues. There were monuments to these baseball players. And he, okay, we get it. You're from New York and you like the Yankees and you're all nostalgic about it. I fucking get it, Billy Crystal. Shut up about the fucking Yankees. Do the Yankees not get enough love and affection in this country to suit you? You need to you feel you need to share how wonderful the Yankees are with the rest? Fuck the Yankees. This is from an Orioles fan. Fuck the Yankees. Anyway, that's five stupid things about Billy Crystal completely off the top of my head. The hardest part was only picking five. Catch you next time. Patrick Dodds, Steve, what do you think of M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable? To me, it seems like the last of the two good movies he ever did. And more than that, one of the greatest comic book movies of all time. Even Quentin Tarantino holds it in high regard. What's your take on it? Also, as a bonus question, why do you think Shyamalan's quality of film output has changed so radically from The Sixth Sense and Unbreakable to Killer Plants? I really like Unbreakable a lot. Unbreakable is one of my favorite superhero movies. Uh, comic book type movies. I, I think it's just in really, really great. I I like it better than The Sixth Sense, honestly. I think it's, it's probably, at, at this point when I look back, it's probably my favorite Shyamalan movie. I just really, really love Unbreakable. I love the way it sort of deconstructs and explores uh, the superhero story, the origin story, in a way that you, it allows you to look at it from a different point of view and to take it a little more seriously because it's not uh, an established hero like, the, the Bruce Willis character is not Superman or Spider-Man or Batman or whoever. Uh, it's an original character, and it's presented in a more realistic way, uh, as opposed to, like, a big-budget adventure CGI rock'em sock'em superhero movie. So I, I love Unbreakable. I think it's great. Um, why is Shyam has Shyamalan's output taken such a nosedive since then? I think maybe he just ran out of gas. I think creatively he just ran out of gas. I think also maybe he became more enamored of himself as a writer. He, he be began to believe in his own talent uh, and his own abilities maybe a little too much. He was incredibly successful, with, especially with The Sixth Sense, but also to a lesser extent with Unbreakable and with Signs. And uh, he just sort of started believing his own press. Timothy Mastic. Hi, Steve. I recently got into a heated discussion about the difference in racism between an ad for the NAACP awards featuring all non-white people 
and the Oscars these last couple years who awarded and I think nominated actor director awards only to white people, including nominations from race oriented movies like Selma. My own thoughts are that racism is an institutionalized marginalization that white people haven't ever faced in this country, but how would you differentiate between those two award ceremonies? Well, the difference is, if people of color felt they were fairly represented by a mainstream award show like the Oscars, they would probably have never felt any need to create their own award shows, to showcase their own excellence. That's the difference. The only reason why the NAACP awards and, and the, the BET awards and the, the other sort of uh, award shows that are focused on people of color, the only reason why those exist in the first place is because those people and their performances were not being celebrated and were not being recognized by the mainstream culture. The Oscars are a mainstream award organization a mainstream award that, that is given to people you know from the the entire industry and the reason why uh, black folks have decided that they need to create their own award shows is because they have not been represented in the mainstream it's the same reason why we have black history month why we have gay pride parades it's marginalized overlooked people who are taking it upon themselves to assert themselves and present themselves and make themselves visible and celebrate themselves because they have not gotten that from the wider culture Joseph Opiano, hey Steve, the past couple of semesters here at college haven't been going as well as I'd like them to, and it's because I have some issues with time management. I thought switching to a major in film studies would help, given that it's a subject I love and have knowledge about, but I still find myself putting off assignments until the last minute, and my grades have suffered for it. Perhaps I'm just not ready for college. What did you do in the time between graduating from high school and starting college? In what ways did that time help you grow? Maybe if I did the same thing and went out to gain some life experience, I could mature out of my current mindset and come back more prepared for my senior year. The one thing that hasn't changed is my goal to get a degree, even if it means taking more time than my peers. Well, what I did was uh, mope around my parents' house <laughs> for a little while after, after high school and then get a job and, and work for about five years. Uh, and it was a low paying job. I think I've mentioned several times in other videos, I worked as a, a maintenance worker for a truck stop in Hagerstown. And you know, I had my own apartment, paid my rent, lived with a roommate, uh, just did the adult thing, you know, got out and got my independence and, and figured out what that was and what that was like. So, I mean, and, and, when, I did, and when I did go to college after that, uh, I did feel like I had, I was approaching it from a different, point of view than a lot of the people who were who were entering college with me who were 18 years old and, and right out of, of high school because uh, they were going to college I think in many cases because college was the next thing you know you graduate high school you go to college that's just it's just the next thing and it's something that yeah you want to get the most out of it you want to enjoy it but it's also something you just kind of have to get through because you get through college and then it's it's the next thing and for me I was going to college because I wanted to and I felt very grateful to be there. And, and, and now, eventually, after four years, I mean, that did kind of wear off. I dragged my feet my last year as well and felt that sort of pressure, that sort of, that, and that, that malaise and that feeling of like, oh, God, is this over? You know, I really, I felt that. You know, so if you're feeling that going into your senior year, I mean, I felt that too even though I, I waited and I, I went out and, and, and lived a little, quote unquote, before I, I went to college. I still felt that. So uh, maybe that's inevitable. <laughs> maybe now that you're almost done, the best thing would be just to push through and, and to just finish. Uh, but by the same token, look, you need to do what is best for you and you need to do what, what is in your heart to do. And if you think it would be better for you and better for your grades and better for your degree, better for your experience, to take some time off and go do something else for a while. If, if that option is open to you, then I think you should do that. And then come back in a few years or however long and finish and get your degree if that's, if that's what you want to do. Um, but I just, you know, I, I took some time away from, from school after high school. I worked, paid my bills, whatever, and then went back to college um, from that part, from that point in my life. And I still felt that restlessness and that lack of motivation in my senior year, so there might not be any way to avoid that, unfortunately, uh, if if we have that in common. <sighs> and there's no way to avoid this either, my friends. You know what that sound means. It's time for... The Lightning Round! 
Rapid fire questions. Glib and adequate answers. Jim Bailey. Steve, have you done a five stupid things about feminism? No, I have not. I have a concept for it. I know when I eventually do it. I know what it will be and I know how it will go. Uh, and I will love it, and most of the people who have been pounding their fists and holding their breath and demanding that I do five stupid things about feminism are going to hate it, uh, which will make it all the more worth doing. But I have no idea when that's going to be. It might not be for a while, but I know what it's going to be when I finally do it. Ahoy year no. If given a superpower, any superpower will do, do you think you'll resist temptation and use it for the better, or do you think you'll eventually use it for less ethical purposes? I think I'll be the best superhero ever for the first few years, and then eventually I'll start using it for less ethical things. You know, I think that's probably how it would go. I think the, the most unrealistic thing about Superman, and also the most moving and admirable thing about Superman, is that he stays Superman the whole time. He's not just Superman for the first couple years and then he gets lazy or he gets, you know, selfish and he's just like, oh, man, fuck the superhero thing. And he just starts using his powers for his own good. Um, the most that, That's both the most wonderful and also the most unrealistic thing, unfortunately, I think about Superman. So that, that's probably how I would go. Der Wunderbar Bar. Now that the animated feature, The Killing Joke, is a certainty, are you looking forward to it? I know I am, like a kid in a candy store. And I do hope that it becomes R-rated now that WB has stated that they will allow such a rating. Um, I don't, I mean, don't let this dampen your enthusiasm, because if you're really excited for it, I think that's great, but I have not really enjoyed a lot of the, the Warner Brothers animated stuff, the animated, you know, direct-to-video features they've done about the DC Comics characters. Um, a couple of them, mostly the earlier ones, I thought were pretty good, but I just, I haven't even watched them for the last several years because I just kind of lost it. I didn't think the Batman Year One one was very good. Uh, I didn't think the, the Dark Knight Returns one was very good. I just, so I love The Killing Joke. I, the Killing Joke comic is one of my favorite comics ever, but I'm just, I'm just not looking forward to the animated thing. I just don't care. I don't really have the confidence that it's going to be that good. Uh, Bozo the Skeptical Hermit Crab. Godless Geezer is cool. I'm glad you gave him a shout out. I've been pondering something lately, Steve, and have come to no solid conclusions. Perhaps you could help me out. What is the best way to deal with inverted nipples? Well, thank you for saying that about Godless Geezer. I'm sure he appreciates being mentioned in your inverted nipple question. You just have to accept it. You just have to accept yourself as you are, or if you are a religious believer, if you will, as God made you. You have inverted nipples. That's just the way you are. Learn to appreciate the beauty of that. Or if you can afford it, maybe go get some corrective plastic surgery. Old Comic One. Hey, Steve, I've been real busy and haven't had much time for YouTube. Did you miss me? I did miss you. And I was relieved to see your comment. It's, it's, I'm, it's good to know that you're still alive. I mean, let's face it. That is a consideration at this point. John. Kevin Logan, why are you such a nerd? Because, I, I mean, I'm not really a... Kevin. Peter Lilith Balog, do you play... Board games, Steve? Not just the classic ones like Monopoly or Scrabble, but more of the geeky ones? No, not really. The geekiest board game I play is probably Risk, which is considered a classic one. I don't really play any of the more geeky, esoteric, you know, uh, uh, board games. But I, I do enjoy the classics. Ben Shrilla, what are your thoughts on Madeleine Albright's comments about female Sanders supporters? I thought it was a, uh, incredibly short-sighted and dismissive of her to say that uh, what to say what she said and to sort of uh, not only dismiss the the many women who are supporting Bernie Sanders but also to sort of galvanize that support and uh, if I if, if if I'm on Hillary's side and I'm hoping that Hillary gets the nomination the last thing I would want to do in campaigning for her to get that nomination is to alienate other Democrats because if Hillary gets the nomination uh, she's going to need support from the entire party. So I, I would not be trying to piss off other Democrats and sort of, you know, uh, uh, delegitimize their support of the other candidate, uh, you know, in a really rude way uh, on the way to Hillary getting the nomination. I, I just think it was a really boneheaded thing to say. 
uh, in addition to being just, you know, really just dismissive and, and, and not cool. Vitamin W, have you kept up with the Fine Brothers copyright controversy? Do you have an opinion? Greed on their part? Overreaction by the fans? Somewhere in the middle? Or simply YouTube drama? I do not give a single shit about the Fine Brothers thing. I've never watched the Fine Brothers ever. I mean, I just, I've never watched a single one of their videos. It's never been of interest to me. Uh, I didn't care about React World and the whole thing. The, the, and if you want to know what I feel about it, I, I would, if I were more informed on it, I would probably feel the same way that uh, Jason with a D feels about it. <laughs> so if you watch last week's episode of Opinionville, where the puppets are talking about uh, the Fine Brothers controversy, or they're satirizing it, uh, just watch that. And that's probably how I would feel if I knew more about it or I cared more about it. But I don't. <laughs> Hey, that's the end of the lightning round. That's it for the questions. Now it's time for the shout out. And the shout out this week goes to an amazing channel that I have just discovered over the last few weeks and is a relatively new channel. It's, she's only been doing content for the last couple months, I think. But it is the YouTube channel of the wonderful, the amazing, the awesome, the criminally undersubscribed Natalie Alford. You might not know who Natalie Alford is, but you want to know. You need to know. You should know. You should go to Natalie Alford's YouTube channel right now and you should check out her stuff because it is fantastic. She is someone who comes at things from an intersectional feminist, atheist perspective. She talks about women's rights. She talks about uh, uh, intersectional feminism and intersectional social justice in general. She talks about racial justice. She talks about, and, and she does it all from the, uh, a very uh, intelligent and engaged and passionate and informed position. She talks about pop culture. She did a great video the other day that I watched about uh, Beyonce's new music video and her thoughts on that, and it was just terrific. Uh, she uh, has also just this week put up a video, and the, the, re the main reason why I'm giving her a shout out this week as opposed to some other week, uh, she put up a video recently raising awareness of the fact that an organization called Rape Victim Advocates has uh, recently uh, had, its, had to face having its funding cut in its Chicago office, and they might have to, to cut services to uh, sexual assault victims that they offer. Uh, they, they, they do some really wonderful, really important necessary things and they're they're facing their funding being cut and natalie put up a video promoting uh promoting the organization itself and promoting uh, a fundraiser to sort of help it out so in addition to going to natalie's youtube channel and subscribing and watching her stuff and just uh seeing how great she is i would also recommend that you watch her video on rape victim advocates which is linked in the description box of this video and if you are able and if you are so moved go and contribute to that fundraiser to help out this really amazing organization that needs help and thank you Natalie for for making me aware of it and thank you Natalie for just generally being fucking awesome I think you're great and I hope uh, other people watching this video think so too I also want to remind you as I always do to go check out the let me listen podcasts these are podcasts that are created by Jason Harding the aforementioned Jason with a D the puppet master of Opinionville he does three awesome podcasts as a part of the Lemmy Listen family he does Lemmy Finish with Finite Atticus he does American Monsters and How to Destroy Them which uh, has its complete first season up that you can listen to that is hilarious as you prepare for the second season which is coming up and then he also does Late Seating which is a movie review podcast that he co-hosts with me where we talk about classic films or notoriously bad films we give them a fresh review we make fun of them whether we like them or not and it's just a goddamn fun movie podcast that you should listen to that I love to do and I just am really proud of and really happy with. You can listen to all of the Lemmy Listen podcasts at lemmylistenpodcasts.com and I really, really hope that you do because they're terrific. That's it for me, everybody. I am out of here. I want to remind you to please leave a comment on this video asking me your question for next time because in order for me to do this, you have to ask, so ask me a question. Nothing is too serious, nothing is too silly. I will answer as many of them as I possibly can in the next video. So until then, so long, farewell, auf Wiedersehen, goodbye, see you later, ta-ta, and then just a wave. <sighs> Suzanne, why did you have to ask for so much? Hey! Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it and share it and subscribe to this channel if you're not subbed already. And also, please 
consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash steveshives to become a patron. Help me make that Suzanne Summers money. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.